Hi everyone, happy Band Books Week and welcome to Books on the Chopping Block, City Lit Theater's presentation of dramatic readings by professional actors from the top 10 most frequently challenged books in the country. A challenge is defined as a formal written complaint filed with a school or library requesting that books be removed due to their content or appropriateness. Every year, the American Library Association's Office of Intellectual Freedom keeps track of these formal complaints and compiles the list of the top 10 books. Our actors today will be reading from those books for you. Book number 10, The Hate You Give, is a young adult novel by Angie Thomas that follows the events in the life of a 16-year-old girl, Star Carter, who is drawn to activism after she witnesses the police shooting of her childhood friend. Despite winning multiple awards and being the most searched for book in its debut year, The Hate You Give has been challenged for profanity and because it was thought to promote an anti-police message. Kenya begged me to come to this party for weeks. I knew I'd be uncomfortable as hell, but every time I told Kenya no, she said I acted like I'm too good for a garden party. I got tired of hearing that shit and decided to prove her wrong. I slipped my hands into my pockets. As long as I play it cool and keep to myself, I should be fine. Stop. A sea of people part for him like he's a brown skinned Moses. He hugs me, smelling like soap and baby powder. What's up, girl? Ain't seen you in a minute. You don't text nobody, nothing. Where you been? School and the basketball team keeps me busy. But I'm always at the store. You're the one no one sees anymore. He wipes his nose like he always does before I lie. I've been busy. Obviously. The brand new Jordans, the crisp white tee, the diamonds in his ears. When you grow up in Garden Heights, you know what busy really means. Fuck. I wish he wasn't that kind of busy, though. I don't know if I want to tear up or smack him. But the way Khalil looks at me with those hazel eyes makes it hard to be upset. How's your grandma and Cameron? They I Grandma's sick, though. Doctor says she got cancer or whatever. Damn. Sorry, Kay. Yeah, she taking chemo. She ain't worried about getting a wig, though. <laughs> She'll be I Is your mama helping with Cameron? Good old star. Always looking for the best in people. You know she ain't helping. Hey, it, it was just a question. She came in the store the other day. She looks better. For now. She claims she's trying to get clean, but it's the usual. She'll go clean for a few weeks, decide she wants one more hit, then be back at it. But like I said, I'm good. Cameron's good. Grandma's good. That's all that matters. The music changes. And Drake raps from the speakers. I nod to the beat and rap along under my breath. Everyone on the dance floor yells out, start it from the bottom, now we hear part. Can't believe you still love whiny Ash Drake. Leave my husband alone. Your corny husband. Baby, you my everything. You all I ever wanted. I push him with my shoulder and he laughs, his drink splashing over the sides of the cup. <laughs> you know that's what he sound like. I flip him off. He puckers his lips and makes a kissing sound. All these months apart and we've fallen back into normal like it's nothing. Khalil grabs a napkin from a coffee table and wipes drinks off his Jordans. He scrubs the shoes with an, his napkin. I cringe. With each hard rub, the shoe cries for help. No lie, every time a sneaker is cleaned improperly, a kitten dies. Khalil, Either wipe gently back and forth or dab. Don't scrub, for real. Okay, Miss Sneakerhead. A commotion stirs. In the middle of the dance floor, voices argue louder than the music. Cuss words fly left and right. Pop! A shot rings out. I duck. Pop! A second shot. The crowd stampedes towards the door, which leads to more cussing and fighting since it's impossible for everyone to get out at once. Khalil grabs my hand. He pulls me through the crowd, shoving people out of our way and stepping on shoes. Khalil leads me to a Chevy Impala parked under a dim street light. We screech off, leaving chaos in the rearview mirror. Always some shit. 
can't have a party without somebody getting shot. Khalil's Impala is nice. Not all flashy like some guys' cars. I didn't see any rims before I got in, and the front seat had cracks in the leather. Who do you think got shot? Probably a King Lord. Some garden disciples came in when I got there. Something was bound to pop off. Khalil cranks up his stereo, blasting an old rap song Daddy has played a million times. Why are you always listening to that old stuff? Man, get out of here. Tupac was the truth. Yeah, 20 years ago. Nah, even now. Like, check this. Pac said thug life stood for the hate you give little infants fucks everybody. What? Listen, the hate you, the letter you, give little infants fucks everybody. Thug life, meaning so what society gives us as youth, it bites in the ass when we wild out. Get it? Damn. Yeah. See? Told you he was relevant. Now I'm wondering what he's doing to fuck everybody. As much as I think I know, I hope I'm wrong. I need to hear it from him. So why have you really been busy? Where you want me to take you? Your house or the store? Khalil. Your house or the store? If you're selling that stuff. Mind your business, Star. Don't worry about me. I'm doing what I got to do. Bullshit. You know my dad would help you out. I don't need help from nobody, okay? And that little minimum wage job your pops gave me didn't make nothing happen. I got tired of choosing between lights and food. I thought your grandma was working. She was. When she got sick, them clowns at the hospital claimed they worked with her. Two months later, she wasn't pulling her load on the job because when you're going through chemo, you can't pull big-ass garbage bins around. They fired her. <laughs> Funny, huh? The hospital fired her because she was sick. It's silent in the Impala except for Tupac asking, who do you believe in? I don't know. A whoop whoop sound startles us, and blue lights flash in the rearview mirror. Book number nine, The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison, tells the story of Pakola, a young African-American girl growing up after the Great Depression, who is constantly considered ugly because of her mannerisms and her dark skin. The Bluest Eye has been challenged for many reasons since its original publication in 1970, and in 2020, it was banned and challenged because it was considered sexually explicit and because it depicts child sexual abuse. Pretty eyes. Pretty blue eyes. Big blue pretty eyes. Run, Jip, run. Jip runs, Alice runs. Alice has blue eyes. Jerry has blue eyes. Jerry runs. Alice runs. They run with their blue eyes. Each night, without fail, she prayed for blue eyes. Fervently, for a year, she had prayed. Although somewhat discouraged, she was not without hope. To have something as wonderful as that happen would take a long, long time. She walks down Garden Avenue to a small grocery store which sells penny candy. Three pennies are in her shoe, slipping back and forth between the sock and the inner sole. With each step, she feels the painful press of the coins against her foot. There's plenty of time to consider what to buy. Now, however, she moves down an avenue, gently buffeted by the familiar and therefore loved images. The dandelions at the base of the telephone pole. Why, she wonders, do people call them weeds? She thought they were pretty. There was the sidewalk crack shaped like a Y and the other one that lifted the concrete up from the dirt floor. Frequently, her sloughing step had made her trip over that one. These and other inanimate things she saw and experienced. They were real to her. She knew them. They were the codes and touchstones of the world, capable of translation and possession. She climbs four wooden steps to the door of Yakubowski's Fresh Veg Meat and Sundry Store. A bell tinkles as she opens it. Standing before the counter, 
she looks at the array of candies. All Mary Janes, she decides. Three for a penny. She pulls off her shoe and takes out the three pennies. The gray head of Mr. Yakubowski looms up over the counter. He urges his eyes out of his thoughts to encounter her. Blue eyes, blear dropped. Slowly, like Indian summer moving imperceptibly toward fall, he looks toward her. He does not see her, because for him there is nothing to see. How can a 52-year-old white immigrant storekeeper with the taste of potatoes and beer in his mouth see a little black girl? Yeah. She looks up at him and sees the vacuum where curiosity ought to lodge. And something more. The total absence of human recognition. She does not know what keeps his glance suspended. Perhaps because he is grown, or a man and she a little girl. But she has seen interest, disgust, even anger in grown male eyes. Yet this vacuum is not new to her. It has an edge. Somewhere in the bottom lid is the distaste. She has seen it lurking in the eyes of all white people. So the distaste must be for her, her blackness. All things in her are flux and anticipation, but her blackness is static and dread. And it is the blackness that accounts for, that creates the vacuum edged with distaste in white eyes. She points her finger at the Mary Janes, a little black shaft of finger, its tip pressed on the display window. The quietly inoffensive assertion of a black child's attempt to communicate with the white adult. Them. Ah, these, these, these. She shakes her head, her fingertip fixed on the spot which, in her view, at any rate, identifies the Mary Janes. He cannot see her view. The angle of his vision, the slant of her finger, makes it incomprehensible to him. His lumpy red hand plops around in the glass casing. Christ, can't you talk? His fingers brush the Mary Janes. She nods. Well, why didn't you say so? One? How many? Pecola unfolds her fist, showing the three pennies. He scoops three Mary Janes toward her, three yellow rectangles in each packet. She holds the money toward him. He hesitates, not wanting to touch her hand. Finally, he reaches over and takes the pennies from her hand. His nails graze her damp palm. Outside, Pecola feels the inexplicable shame ebb dandelions. A dart of affection leaps out from her to them. But they do not look at her and do not send love back. She thinks they are ugly. They are weeds. Preoccupied with that revelation, she trips on the sidewalk crack. Anger stirs and wakes in her. Her thoughts fall back to Mr. Yakubowski's eyes, his phlegmy voice. The anger will not hold. The shame wells up again, its muddy rivulets seeping into her eyes. What to do before the tears come? She remembers the Mary Janes. Each pale yellow wrapper has a picture on it. A picture of little Mary Jane, for whom the candy is named. Smiling white face, blonde hair in gentle disarray, blue eyes looking at her out of a world of clean comfort. The eyes are petulant, mischievous. To Pecola, they are simply pretty. She eats the candy, and its sweetness is good. To eat the candy is somehow to eat the eyes, 
eat Mary Jane, love Mary Jane, be Mary Jane. Three pennies had bought her nine lovely orgasms with Mary Jane, lovely Mary Jane, for whom a candy is named. Book number eight of Mice and Men by John Steinbeck is a novella first published in 1937. It narrates the experiences of George and Lenny, two migrant farm workers as they travel from place to place in California. Of Mice and Men has most recently been challenged for racial slurs and racist stereotypes and their negative effect on students. Crooks the Negro Stable Buck had his bunk in the harness room, a little shed that leaned off the wall of the barn. It was Saturday night. In the stable buck's room, a small electric globe threw a meager yellow light. Noiselessly, Lenny appeared in the doorway and stood there looking in, his big shoulders nearly filling the opening. For a moment, Crooks did not see him, but on raising his eyes, he stiffened and a scowl came across his face. Lenny smiled helplessly in an attempt to make friends. You got no right coming to my room. This is my room. Nobody's got any right in here but me. I ain't doing nothing. Just come to look at my puppy, and I've seen your light. Well, I got a right to have a light. You want, you go on to get out of my room. I ain't wanted in the bunkhouse, and you ain't wanted in my room. Why ain't you wanted? Because I'm black. They play cards in there, but I can't play because I'm black. They say I stink. Well, I tell you, you all stink to me. Everybody went into town. Slim and George and everybody. George says I gotta stay here and not get in no trouble. I seen your light. Well, what do you want? Nothing. I seen your light. I thought I could just come in and say it. I don't know what you're doing in the barn anyway. You ain't no Skinner. There's no call for a bucket to come into the barn at all. You ain't no Skinner. You ain't got nothing to do with the horse. The pup. I came to see my pup. Well, go see your pup then. Don't come in my place where you're not wanted. Lenny lost his smile. He advanced a step into the room, then remembered and back to the door again. I looked at him a little. Slim says I ain't to pet him very much. Come on in and sit a while. As long as you won't get out and leave me alone, you might as well sit down. All the boys gone into town, huh? All but old Candy. He just sits in the bunkhouse sharpening his pencil and sharpening and figuring. Figuring? What's Candy figuring about? About the rabbits. <laughs> You're nuts. You're crazy as a wedge. What rabbits you talking about? The rabbits we're going to get, and I get to tend them, cut grass, and give them water, and like that. Just nuts. I don't blame the guy you travel with for keeping you out of sight. It ain't no lie. We're going to do it. Going to get a little place and live on the fat of the land. You think it's a lie, but it ain't no lie. Every word's the truth, and you can ask George. You travel around with George, don't you? Sure. Me and him goes every place together. Sometimes he talks and you don't know what the hell he's talking about. Ain't that so? Yeah. Sometimes. Just talks on and you don't know what the hell it's all about. Yeah. Sometimes, but not always. I ain't no Southern Negro. I was born right here in California. My old man had a chicken ranch about 10 acres. The white heads come to play at our place. And sometimes... I went to play with them, and some of them was pretty nice. My old man didn't like that. I never knew till long later why he didn't like that, but I know now. There wasn't much colored families for miles around, and now there ain't a colored man on this ranch, and there's just one family in Soledad. If I say something, why, it's just a nigger saying it. How long you think it'll be before them pups will be old enough to pay it? <laughs> a guy can talk to you and be sure you won't go blabbing. A couple of weeks and them pups will be all right. George knows what he's talking about. Just talks and you don't understand the thing. I've seen it over and over. A guy talking to another guy and it don't make no difference if he don't hear or understand. The thing is, they're talking or they're sitting still not talking. It don't make no difference. No difference. It's just the talking. 
It's just being with another guy. That's all. Suppose George don't come back no more. Suppose he took a powder and just ain't coming back. What do you do then? What? I said, suppose George went into town tonight and you never heard from him no more. Just suppose that. He, he won't do it. George wouldn't do nothing like that. I've been with George a long time. He'll, he'll come back tonight. D don't you think he will? Nobody can't tell what a guy will do. Let's say he wants to come back and can't. Suppose he gets killed or hurt so he can't come back. George won't do nothing like that. George is careful. He won't get hurt. He ain't never been hurt because he's careful. Well, suppose, just suppose he don't come back. What do you do then? I don't know. Say, what you doing anyway? Th this ain't true. George ain't got hurt. Want me to tell you what'll happen? They'll take you to the booby hatch. They'll tie you up with a collar like a dog. Who hurt George? It, I, I, I was just supposing George ain't hurt. He's all right. He'll be back. What you supposing for? Ain't nobody going to suppose no hurt to George. Just just sit down. George ain't hurt. Ain't nobody going to talk no hurt to George. Maybe you can see now. You got George. You know he's coming back. Suppose you didn't have nobody. Suppose you couldn't go into the bunkhouse and play rummy because you was black. How'd you like that? Suppose you had to sit out here and read books. Sure, you could play horseshoe till it got dark, but then you gotta go read books. Books ain't no good. A guy needs somebody to be near him. A, a guy goes nuts if he ain't got nobody. Don't make no difference who the guy is as long as he's with you. I tell you, a guy gets too lonely and he gets sick. George gonna come back. Maybe George come back already. Maybe I better go see. I didn't mean to scare you. He'll come back. I was talking about myself. A guy sits alone out here all night, maybe reading books or thinking or stuff like that. Something, he gets he gets to thinking. And he's got nothing, no one to tell him what's so and what ain't so. Maybe if he sees something, he, he don't know whether it's right or not. He can't turn to some other guy and ask him if he sees it too. Book number seven, To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee, was a novel first published in 1960. This Pulitzer Prize winning novel, considered an American classic, has most recently been banned and challenged for racial slurs and their negative effect on students, for featuring a white savior character, and for its perception of the black experience. Jim condescended to take me to school the first day. A job usually done by one's parents, but Atticus had said Jim would be delighted to show me where my room was. I think some money changed hands in this transaction, for as we trotted around the corner past the Radley Place, I heard an unfamiliar jingle in Jim's pockets. When we slowed to a walk at the edge of the schoolyard, Jim was careful to explain that during school hours I was not to bother him. I was not to approach him with requests to enact a chapter of Tarzan and Ant-Man, to embarrass him with references to his private life, or tag along behind him at recess and noon. I was to stick with the first grade, and he would stick with the fifth. In short, I was to leave him alone. Before the first morning was over, Miss Caroline Fisher, our teacher, hauled me up to the front of the room and patted the palm of my hand with a ruler, then made me stand in the corner until noon. Miss Caroline was no more than 21. She had bright auburn hair, pink cheeks, and wore crimson fingernail polish. She also wore high-heeled pumps and a red and white striped dress. She looked and smelled like a peppermint dropper. She boarded across the street one door down from us in Miss Maudy Atkinson's upstairs front room, and when Miss Maudy introduced us to her, Jim was in a haze for days. Miss Caroline printed her name on the blackboard. This says that I am Miss Caroline Fisher. I am from North Alabama, from Winston County. The class murmured apprehensively should she prove to harbor her share of the peculiarities indigenous to that region. When Alabama seceded from the Union on January 11, 1861, Winston County seceded from Alabama, and every child in Macomb County knew it. North Alabama was full of liquor interests, big mules, steel companies, Republicans, professors, and other persons of no background. 
Miss Caroline began the day by reading us a story about cats. The cats had long conversations with one another. They wore cunning little clothes and lived in a warm house beneath the kitchen stove. By the time Mrs. Cat called the drugstore for an order of chocolate malted mice, the class was wriggling like a bucket full of catawba worms. Miss Caroline seemed unaware that the ragged, denim-shirted, and flower-sack-skirted first grade, most of whom had chopped cotton and fed hogs from the time they were able to walk, were immune to imaginative literature. Miss Caroline got to the end of the story and said, Oh my, wasn't that nice? Then she went to the blackboard and printed the alphabet in enormous capital letters, turned to the class and asked, Does anybody know what these are? Everybody did. Most of the first grade had failed it last year. I suppose she chose me because she knew my name. As I read the alphabet, a faint line appeared between her eyebrows, and after making me read most of my first reader and the stock market quotations from the mobile register aloud, she discovered that I was literate and looked at me with more than faint distaste. Miss Caroline told me to tell my father not to teach me anymore. It would interfere with my reading. Teach me? He hasn't taught me anything, Miss Caroline. Aunt Atticus ain't got time to teach me anything. Why, he's so tired at night, he just sits in the living room and reads. If he didn't teach you, who did? Somebody did. You weren't born reading the Mobile Register. Jam says I was. He read in a book where I was a bullfinch instead of a finch. Jim says my name's really Jean Louise Bullfinch, that I got swapped when I was born, and I'm really a bull- Let's not let our imaginations run away with us, dear. Now, you tell your father not to teach you any more. It's best to begin reading with a fresh mind. Now, you tell him I'll take over from here and try to undo the damage. Ma'am? Your father does not know how to teach. You can take a seat now. I mumbled that I was sorry and retired, meditating upon my crime. I never deliberately learned to read, but somehow I had been wallowing illicitly in the daily papers. In the long hours of church, was it then I learned? I could not remember not being able to read the hymns. Now that I was compelled to think about it, reading was something that just came to me as learning to fasten the seat of my union suit without looking round or achieving two boats from a snarl of shoelaces. I could not remember when the lines above Atticus's moving fingers separated into words, but I had stared at them all evenings in my memory, listening to the news of the day, bills to be enacted into laws, the diaries of Lorenzo Dow, anything Atticus happened to be reading when I crawled into his lap every night. Until I feared I would lose it, I never loved to read. One does not love breathing. Book number six, Something Happened in Our Town, A Child's Story About Racial Injustice, is a 2018 children's book by Marianne Solano, Marietta Collins, and Anne Hazard, as well as illustrated by Jennifer Zivion. Something Happened in Our Town has been challenged for containing, quote, divisive language, and it has been thought to promote anti-police views. Something bad happened in our town. The news was on the TV, the radio, and the internet. The grown-ups didn't think we knew about it, but the kids in Ms. Garcia's class heard some older kids talking about it and they had questions. After school, Emma asked her mother, why did the police shoot that man? It was a mistake. I feel sad for the man and his family. The police thought he had a gun. It wasn't a mistake, said Emma's sister Liz. The cops only shot him because he was black. Emma was confused. He is brown, not black. Some people have dark brown skin, and some people have light brown skin. Black usually means African American. Most of their ancestors were brought here from Africa as slaves. I know what a slave is. That's when you have to do whatever the other person says. Yes. Slaves had to do whatever white people told them to do. Even after slavery ended, white people didn't let black people live where they wanted, go to school with white people, or vote. Who are white people? White people came here from places like Europe or Russia or other countries. We are white, even though our skin is a light tan. 
Did our family do those bad things a long time ago? Yes. Back then, many white people thought that they were better than black people, even though it wasn't true. Some white people still think most black men and boys are dangerous, even though they're not. Was the man that got shot dangerous? No. Shooting him was a mistake. A mistake that's a part of a pattern. Like the pattern of my blanket? Yes. But this pattern is being nice to white people and mean to black people. It's an unfair pattern. Suppose you had a birthday party and invited everyone in your class except for the black kids. How would they feel? They would be sad. Or mad. And you would be missing out because you never know who's going to be your best friend. And you can help others be fair. Like telling Anna to stop teasing Ling about her name? Yes. Just like that. In another house, Josh asked his mother, Can police go to jail? Yes. Why do you ask? That white policeman who shot the black man? Will he go to jail? What he did was wrong. But he won't go to jail. Why not? Cops stick up for each other, said Josh's brother Malcolm. And they don't like black men. Josh was confused. Why not? Some police are black. You're right. Uncle James is a police officer, and so is my friend Kenya. There are many cops, black and white, who make good choices. But we can't always count on them to do what's right. Malcolm added that he could get stopped by the police just because he is black, even if he didn't do anything wrong. That's not fair, said Josh. What if it was a white man in the car? They probably wouldn't have even stopped the car. Sometimes white people are treated better than black people, but it's not right. Everybody should be treated fairly. We're proud of who we are. Harriet Tubman, Martin Luther King, and Nelson Mandela were strong and brave Black leaders. They showed us that we can stand up for our rights and set good examples for others. They were treated unfairly, but helped others learn to be more fair. But some people haven't learned yet. Why are you mad? I'm mad that we're still treated poorly sometimes. But I can use my anger to make things better. Black people have a lot of power if we work together to make changes. I have power. And I'm smart. You're right. And you can change people's hearts by sticking up for someone who is not treated fairly. Like how Malcolm sticks up for me when the kids tease me about my glasses? He tells them to step off. Just like that. The next day, a new kid joined Emma and Josh's class. His name was Omad, and he was from a country far away. Omad didn't know where to sit or what to do because it was his first day in school. He talked a little bit, but it was hard to understand him. He said he was learning English. After lunch, the class went outside to play soccer. Daniel and Sophia picked kids to be on their teams. All of the kids were picked to be on a team except Omad. Daniel said Omad probably didn't know how to play because he was new. Sophia said Oman might not be good at soccer. Josh remembered what his mother said about sticking up for people who are treated unfairly. Emma remembered what her father said about unfair patterns and birthday parties. All of a sudden, Oman wasn't alone. Emma and Josh were leading him to their team. Daniel said, We have enough kids on our team. We don't need him. But Josh was ready. Step off! He's playing. Yeah, we don't want to miss out. And just like that, Emma and Josh gained a new friend and started a better pattern at their school. Book number five, The Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian by Sherman Alexie is about Junior, a budding cartoonist growing up on the Spokane Indian Reservation. Consistently challenged since its publication in 2007 for acknowledging issues such as poverty, alcoholism, and sexuality, this National Book Award winner has been banned and challenged for profanity, sexual references, and allegations of sexual misconduct by the author. 
A warrior isn't afraid of confrontation, so I went to school and walked right up to Gordy. Gordy, I need to talk to you. I don't have time. I have to debug some PCs. Don't you hate PCs? They are sickly and fragile and vulnerable to viruses. PCs are like French people living during the bubonic plague. I much prefer Max, don't you? They're so poetic. Wow. And people thought I was a freak. Computers are computers. One or the other, it's all the same. So, Mr. Spirit, are you going to bore me with your tautologies, or are you actually going to say something? Tautologies? What the heck were tautologies? You don't know what a tautology is, do you? Y yes, I do. Really, I do. Completely, I do. You're lying. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. How can you tell? Because your eyes dilated, your breathing rate increased a little bit, and you started to sweat. Okay, so Gordy was a human lie detector, too. All right, I lied. What is a tautology? A tautology is a repetition of the same sense in different words. It's a redundancy. Oh, you mean redundant, like saying the same thing over and over, but in different ways? Yes. Okay, so... If I said something like, Gordy is a dick without ears and an ear without a dick, then that would be a tautology. That's not exactly a tautology, but it is funny. You have a singular wit. Listen, Gordy, I know you're a genius and all, but you are one weird dude. I'm quite aware of my differences, I wouldn't classify them as weird. Don't get me wrong. I think weird is great. I mean, if you look at all the great people in history, Einstein, Michelangelo, Emily Dickinson, then you are looking at a bunch of weird people. I'm going to be late for class. You're going to be late for class. Perhaps you should, as they say, cut to the chase. I want to be your friend. Excuse me? I want us to be friends. I assure you, I am not a homosexual. No, 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 no. I, I, I didn't mean I want to be friends that way. I just meant regular friends. I mean, you and I, we have a lot in common. Gordy studied me now. I was an Indian kid from the reservation. I was lonely and sad and isolated and terrified, just like Gordy. And so we did become friends. Not the best of friends. We didn't share secrets or dreams, no. We studied together. Gordy taught me how to study. Best of all, he taught me how to read. Listen, you have to read a book three times before you know it. The first time you read it for the story, the plot. The movement from scene to scene that gives the book its momentum, its rhythm. It's like riding a raft down a river. You're just paying attention to the currents. Do you understand that? Not at all. Yes, you do. Okay, I do. I really didn't, but Gordy believed in me. He wouldn't let me give up. The second time you read a book, you read it for its history, for its knowledge of history. You think about the meaning of each word and where that word came from. Who invented the word? Who first used it? And how has the meaning of the word changed since the first time it was used? You have to look all that up. If you don't treat each word that seriously, you're not treating the novel seriously. I suddenly understood that if every moment of a book should be taken seriously, then every moment of a life should be taken seriously as well. But you don't take anything too seriously either. You either read a book for the story, for each of its words, and you draw your cartoons for the story, for each of the words and images. And yeah, you need to take that seriously. But you should also read and draw because... Really good books give you a boner. 
I was shocked. You should get a boner. You have to get a boner. Come on. We ran into the Reardon High School library. Look at all these books. There aren't that many. There are 3,412 books here. I know that because I counted them. Okay, now you're officially a freak. Yes, it's a small library. It's a tiny one. But if you read one of these books a day, it would still take you 10 years to finish. The world, even the smallest parts of it, is filled with things you don't know. Okay. So it's like each of these books is a mystery. Every book is a mystery, and if you read all the books ever written, it's like you've read one giant mystery and no matter how much you learn you just keep on learning because there is always so much more you need to learn yes 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 now doesn't that give you a boner i am rock hard <laughs> well i don't mean a boner in the sexual sense i don't think you should run through life with a real erect penis but you should approach each book you should approach life with the real possibility that you might get a metaphorical boner at any point. <laughs> a metaphorical boner. What the heck is a metaphorical boner? <laughs> when I say boner, I really mean joy. Well, then why didn't you say joy? You didn't have to say boner. I mean, every time I think about boners, I get confused. <laughs> Boner is funnier and more joyful. Gordy and I laughed. He was an extremely weird dude, but he would always be the smartest person I'd ever known. And he certainly helped me through school. He not only tutored me and challenged me, but he made me realize that hard work, the act of finishing, of completing, of accomplishing a task is... Joyous. Book number four, Speak, by Laurie Halls Anderson, is a young adult novel published in 1999 that tells the story of high school freshman Mira Sordino. After a sexual assault results in her busting the end of a summer party, Melinda is ostracized by her peers because she will not say why she called the police. Speak has been banned, challenged, and restricted because it was thought to contain a political viewpoint. It was claimed to be biased against male students and for the novel's inclusion of rape and profanity. Nobody bothered to tell me that study hall was being held in the library today. By the time I find it, the period is almost over. I'm dead. I tried to explain to the librarian, but I keep stuttering and nothing comes out right. The librarian tells me to calm down, calm down. It's okay. Don't get upset. You are Melinda Sordino, right? Don't worry, I'll mark you present. I smile and try to choke out a thank you, but I can't say anything. There's not enough time for a nap, so I check out a stack of books to make the librarian happy. I don't come up with my brilliant idea right then and there. It is born when Mr. Nett tracks me through the cafeteria, demanding my 20 ways the Iroquois survived in the rainforest homework. I pretend I don't see him. I cut through the lunch line, loop around a couple making out by the door, and start down the hall. Mr. Neck stops to break up the PDA. I head for the senior's wing. I am in foreign territory where no freshman has gone before. I don't have time to worry about the looks I'm getting. I can hear Mr. Neck. I turn a corner, open a door, and step into darkness. I hold the doorknob, but Mr. Neck doesn't touch it. I hear his footsteps lumber down the hall. I fill the wall next to the door until I find a light switch. I haven't stumbled into a classroom. It is an old janitor's closet that smells like sour sponges. The back wall has built-in shelves filled with dusty textbooks and a few bottles of bleach. A stained armchair and an old-fashioned desk peeks from behind a collection of mops and brooms. A cracked mirror tilts over a sink littered with 
dead roaches crocheted together with cobwebs. The taps are so rusted they don't turn. No janitor has chilled in this closet for a very long time. The closet is abandoned. It has no purpose, no name. It is a perfect place for me. My parents commanded me to stay after school every day for extra help from teachers. I agreed to stay after school. I hang out in my refurbished closet. It is shaping up nicely. The first thing to go is the mirror. It is screwed to the wall, so I cover it with the poster of Maya Angelou that the librarian gave me. She said, Miss Angelou is one of the greatest American writers. The poster was coming down because the school board banned one of her books. She must be a great writer if the school board is afraid of her. Maya Angelou's picture watches me while I sweep him off the floor, while I scrub shelves, while I chase spiders out of the corners. I do a little bit of work every day. It's like building a fort. I figure Maya would like it if I read in here, so I bring a few books from home. Mostly I watch the scary movies playing on the inside of my eyelids. It is getting harder to talk. My throat is always sore, my lips raw. When I wake up in the morning, my jaws are clenched so tight I have a headache. Sometimes my mouth relaxes around Heather if we're alone. Every time I try to talk to my parents or a teacher, I sputter or freeze. What's wrong with me? It's like I have some kind of spastic laryngitis. I know my head isn't screwed on straight. I want to leave, transfer, warp myself to another galaxy. I want to confess everything and hand over the guilt and mistake and anger to someone else. There is a beast in my gut. I can hear it scraping away at the inside of my ribs. Even if I dump the memory, it will stay with me, staining me. My closet is a good thing, a quiet place that helps me hold these thoughts inside my head where no one can hear them. Book number three, All American Boys by Jason Reynolds and Brendan Kiley is a young adult novel published in 2015. The book tells the story of two teenage boys, Rashad and Quinn, as they handle racism and police brutality in their community. All American Boys has been banned and challenged for profanity, drug use, and alcoholism, and because it was thought to promote anti-police views, contain divisive language, and to be, quote, too much of a sensitive matter right now. Custody. That's the one word I kept hearing over and over again as I drifted in and out of a painkiller coma with a broken nose and a few fractured ribs. Custody. They brought me into the hospital, handcuffs still on, blood still pouring from my nose like a leaky faucet with rusty pipes, my head pounding. Every breath hurt. Custody. The doctor sent me through X-rays, administered pain drugs, fiddled with my nose until it was set back in its original place, even though they made sure to tell me that it would never look the same, that it would always look broken. Custody. A police officer. Not the one who did this to me, but a different one. The one who fingerprinted me. Stood outside the hospital room on guard, making sure I didn't run. As if I could. As if I were a real criminal, as if I were a criminal at all. He stood watch at the door until my parents arrived. Custody. The police officer explained to my folks that I had been caught stealing. Not only that, but that I had been also charged with resisting arrest and public nuisance. There was no point trying to explain. I could barely breathe. The officer read the citations and explained that even though they were misdemeanors, I had been processed and would still have to appear in court. And then, because I'm a minor, my folks had to fill out paper, paperwork so that I could be signed over and returned to their custody. The next morning, when I woke up from it all, there was my mother, 
sitting in the chair on the other side of the hospital room. Ma, I said, instantly wincing. She whipped toward me, sprang from the chair. Rashad, she said, her voice full of all of that motherly stuff. Worry, love, and hope, and fear. Oh, baby, she repeated. How you feeling? The truth was, I was feeling two ways. Physically, I obviously didn't feel great. That's for sure. Every breath felt like a hundred tiny needles sticking me in the chest, and that was breathing through my mouth. Breathing through my nose wasn't an option. The other way I was feeling was just confused. I mean, I hadn't done anything, nothing at all. So why was I hooked up to all these machines lying in this uncomfortable bed? Why was I arrested? Why was my mother waiting there for me to wake up? I'm okay, I said. She sat on the other side of the bed. Listen, I need you to tell me what happened, Rashad. And I need you to be honest with me, okay? But before I could answer, my father came into the room. Rashad. He said my name the same way he said it every other day when he was waking me up for school, as if nothing was wrong. Help me out here, son. I need you to tell me what the hell you were thinking shoplifting. Shoplifting? And from Jerry's, of all places. Dad had that disappointed look on his face. I didn't steal nothing, I said, suddenly feeling too tired to explain, even though I just woke up. Well then, why did the cops say you did? Dad replied, I don't know. Look, baby, just tell us what happened from the beginning. I got to the store just to get gum and chips. I picked the bag of chips I wanted and then I bent down and dug in my back to try to get to my phone so I could call Spoonie. This lady didn't see me squatting behind her and tripped over me. Then I lost my balance and the bag of chips went flying. The cop assumed I had done something to the lady, which I didn't. The dude who works the register looks up and thinks I'm trying to put the chips in my bag, but I wasn't. Then the cop rushed me and yoked me up all crazy. I paused and then added, and that's it. Were your pants sagging? Dad interrogated, now back over by the door. Were my pants sagging? I repeated, shocked by the question. What does that have to do with anything? Oh, it matters. If it walks like a duck and it talks like a duck, my mother glared at him. David. Well? They said you resisted arrest, he continue, continued in another direction. If you didn't do anything wrong, why would you resist arrest? His voice began to rise. And how many times have I told you in Spoonie? I mean, since y'all were young, we've been going over this. Never fight back. Never talk back. Keep your hands up. Keep your mouth shut. Just do what they asked you to do and you'll be fine. That was one of those way too familiar songs Spoonie and I were forced to sing when we were kids. Every time Dad said it, it was always the same. It had a rhythm to it, like a poem or a chant. Never fight back. Never talk back. Keep your hands up. Keep your mouth shut. Just do what they ask you to do and you'll be fine. Book number two, Stamped, Racism, Anti-Racism, and You by Ibram X. Kendi and Jason Reynolds is the middle school version of Kendi's National Book Award winning Stamped from the Beginning, which was written for adults. In the book, key figures and events in black history are discussed, including the religious argument that sought to justify slavery, the racial bias and the war on drugs, and the Black Lives Matter movement. Stamped, Racism, Anti-Racism, and You has been banned and challenged because of some of the author's public statements and because of claims that the book contains, quote, selective storytelling incidents and does not encompass racism against all people. Before we begin, let's get something straight. This is not a history book. I repeat, this is not a history book. At least 
not like the ones you're used to reading in school. The ones that feel more like a list of dates, there will be some, with an occasional war here and there, a declaration, definitely got to mention that, a constitution, that too, a court case or two, and of course, the paragraph that reads, during Black History Month, Harriet, Rosa, Martin. This isn't that. This isn't a history book, or at least it's not that kind of history book. Instead, what this is is a book that contains history. A history directly connected to our lives as we live them right this minute. This is a present book. A book about the here and now. A book that hopefully will help us better understand why we are where we are as Americans, specifically as our identity pertains to race. Uh-oh, the R word, which for many of us still feels rated R, or can be matched only by one with another R word, royal. But don't. Let's all just take a deep breath, inhale, hold it, exhale and breathe out. Race. See? Not so bad. Except for the fact that race has been a strange and persistent poison in American history, which I'm sure you already know. I'm also sure that depending on where you are and where you've grown up, your experience with it, or at least the moment in which you recognize it, may vary. Some may believe race isn't an issue anymore, that it's a thing of the past, old tales of bad times. Others may be certain that race is like an alligator, a dinosaur that never went extinct but instead evolved. And though hiding in murky swamp waters, that leftover monster is still deadly. And then... There are those of you that know that race, and more critically, racism, are everywhere. Those of you see racism regularly robbing people of liberty. Whether as a violent stick-up or as a sly pickpocket, the thief known as racism is all around. This book is not a history history book. This is a present book. It's meant to take you on a race journey from then to now, to show you why we feel how we feel, why we live how we live, and why this position, whether recognizable or unrecognizable, whether it's scream or a whisper, just won't go away. This isn't an end-all, be-all. This isn't the whole meal. It's more like an appetizer. Something in preparation for the feast to come. Something to get you excited about choosing your seat, the right seat at the table. Oh, and there are three words I want you to keep in mind. Three words to describe the people we will be exploring. Segregationists, assimilationists, anti-racists. There are serious definitions to these things, but I'm going to give you mine. Segregationists are haters, like real haters. People who hate you for not being like them. Assimilationists are people who like you, but only with quotation marks, like, like you, meaning they like you because you're like them. And then there are anti-racists. They love you because you're like you. But it's important to note, life can rarely be wrapped into single word descriptions. It isn't neat and perfectly shaped. So sometimes over the course of a lifetime and even over the course of a day, People can take on and act out ideas represented by more than one of these three identities. It can be both and. Just keep that in mind as we explore these folks. And actually, these aren't just the words we'll be using to describe the people in this book. They're also the words we'll use to describe you and me, all of us. Book number one. George by Alex Gino is a children's novel about a young transgender girl. When people look at George, they think they see a boy, but she knows she's not really a boy. She knows she's really a girl. George thinks she's going to have to keep this a secret forever, but when their teacher announces that the class play is going to be Charlotte's Web, George really, really, really wants to play Charlotte. Written for elementary age children, this Lambda Literary Award winner was challenged, banned, and restricted for containing LGBTQIA content for conflicting with a religious viewpoint, and for not reflecting, quote, the values of our community. Kelly and George found a quiet spot at the far end of the fence to practice. George knew her lines and didn't need to look at the sheet once as she spoke, but her heart thumped heavily and she spoke too quickly. 
swallowing the final words of each line. She glanced behind her whenever Kelly spoke to make sure no one was watching. Kelly frowned when they were done. That wasn't your best performance. I know. Do you want to go through it again? No! A few nearby third graders turned their heads in the direction of George's shout. She lowered her voice. I mean, no. It's too open. I'll be all right when I'm alone with Ms. Udell. I still don't know what the big deal is. So you want to play a girl on stage. It's not like you actually want to be a girl. George's face paled. The air grew hot around her. What's wrong? George opened her mouth, but there were no words, so she closed it again. She started to giggle nervously. <laughs> George's charged <laughs> laughter filled the air. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, soon Kelly was chuckling too, though she didn't know why. <laughs> George's laughter grew frantic and she felt lightheaded. So, <laughs> what are we laughing about? Are you serious? Of course I'm serious. I am always serious, except for, you know, when I'm not serious. But right now I'm serious. But you said it. George didn't know whether to be relieved or upset that Kelly didn't see that she was a girl. All I said was... What did I say, George? I mean, I've always thought of myself as a funny person, but I didn't think that I was such a good comedian that I could say something that funny without knowing it. George opened her mouth, but she couldn't say the only words that blared through her brain. I'm a girl! Are you nervous about the audition? Don't be. My dad says that men performing in non-traditional gender roles is good for feminism. Can we not talk about it anymore? Somehow it was worse that Kelly thought it was no big deal that George wanted to be Charlotte in the play than if she had said it was a terrible idea. I congratulate you all for your patience. The time has finally come to see how you fare as actors and actresses. Today you are each reading Charlotte's or Wilbur's lines. If you're interested in trying out, I will give you a card with a number on it. The number will dictate the order of your audition. Girls first, then boys. You will read only your part. I will read the lines of the other characters. Ms. Udell asked the boys who wished to audition to raise their hands. George joined them, lifting her hand just to the height of her head. Ms. Udell counted six blue index cards and passed them out. George was number six, last. Ms. Udell then distributed nine pink cards to girls who raised outstretched fingers and mouthed to numbers to each other. Janelle stood, waving a card with the number one on it. She held the door open for Ms. Udell, who pushed her chair into the hallway where they both disappeared. George tried to bury her mind in her homework. Janelle popped her head in through the doorway, and Kelly bounced up and rushed out of the room. Soon, she came beaming back into the classroom. Number three, you're up! Kelly gave George a thumbs up sign. Eventually, Ms. Udell came in to announce that it was time for the boys to take their turns. Finally, it was George's turn. In the hallway, Ms. Udell sat in the blocky wooden chair. You don't have your sheet, George. Don't need him. Well, that's a good sign. It means you must have practiced. Uh, but do speak up. Before Ms. Udell could say anything else, George closed her eyes and began. The first words rushed out of her mouth, but then she slowed into the cadence she had practiced. She felt herself as Charlotte and gave each word her full attention as it left her tongue. George reached the end of Charlotte's monologue and was ready for the dialogue with Wilbur that followed. But George didn't hear her cue. She opened her eyes. George, what was that? I... But there were no words to finish the sentence. I, I... Was that supposed to be some kind of joke? Because it wasn't very funny. It wasn't a joke. I want to be Charlotte. You know I can't very well cast you as Charlotte. I have too many girls who want the part. Besides, imagine how confused people would be. Now, if you're interested in being Wilbur, that's a possibility. Or maybe Templeton. He's a funny guy. No, thanks. I just... I wanted... Okay, then. 
for now, we need to get into the room to get ready to go. Would you hold the door for me? Ms. Udell pushed her chair back into the classroom, shaking her head. George muttered to herself as she loaded her math book into her bag. Stupid body, stupid brain, stupid boys and stupid girls, stupid everything. When Ms. Udell called her role, George hoisted her bag onto her back and shuffled over to the boys' line, still staring at the ground. 